Good afternoon. My name is Huda Zogby. I'm a professor at Baylor College of Medicine and an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and director of the Jan and Dan Duncan Neurological Research Institute at Texas Children's Hospital. This is the third part of a three-part story about Rett syndrome and MACP2 disorders. In this part, we're going to cover potential future therapies for Rett syndrome and related disorders. In the first part, we talked about MACP2 disorders, loss of function of the gene called MACP2 or methyl CPG binding protein 2 causes Rett syndrome, and doubling it causes a duplication progressive neurological disease. In the second part, we talked about what happens when you lose this gene or doubling, what are the effects on neurological function, and what are the effects on gene expression. In this final part, we're going to discuss potential therapeutics. And in particular, we're going to talk about two modalities of therapies. One, manipulating neuronal networks, and the other, using a small piece of DNA called antisense oligonucleotide. Before we get into the discussion of therapy, I'd like to share with you some considerations as we contemplate therapies for MACP2 disorders. First, we know that losing uh, the red gene and having a female mouse with red syndrome develop all the features of the disease, if you bring that gene back genetically, the disorder can be reversed. Many of the symptoms can be reversed, and that's the word, work from the lab of Adrian Bird. We also know that... I should mention here that having shown that you can actually restore functionality in these adult mice gives us hope that actually maybe if we find a treatment, we might reverse symptoms of people with Rett syndrome. The question is, how do you do it? I mentioned in part one that when you lose... in part two, when you lose the protein, you have hundreds of genes whose expression changes, and they're probably all important for brain function, and they all come from different cell type. So trying to regulate all these genes is really tough. So there are many downstream effects to losing MACP2. Therefore, it's most likely that replacing MACP2 itself, perhaps via gene therapy, is really the best way if we want to be more comprehensive and restore as much function as possible. Of course, this is going to be really important, and this has been tested in mice by providing gene therapy and rescuing some of the phenotype. But this is going to be really important in that we need to deliver it to be sure we get the right dose. Because as I mentioned to you, part one, if you have too much of the protein, you have a different disorder. There are other therapeutic considerations we, consi uh, we can think about. We mentioned that many mutations lower the level of the protein or decrease its activity. So perhaps if we can find regulators that can be pharmacologically manipulated to either stabilize the protein in the case of Rett syndrome, or destabilize it in the case of duplication, that may be helpful. Other approaches that are being investigated in animal models right now is RNA editing. And this is work from Cinnamon and the Gail Mandel lab, where they try to edit the RNA to correct for the mutations. So these are all approaches that uh, so far have been in investigated, and there are efforts also, because... Uh, Rett is on the X chromosome, and there's one mutant allele and one wild-type allele. And as we've learned in part one, in every female cell, only one of the alleles is expressed. Perhaps if one can find a strategy to activate the wild-type allele in every cell, that could be helpful, but that's still being investigated. And last but not least, one approach is to really bypass the molecular effect and go straight to the brain network and manipulate the brain network, and in that, perhaps improve behavior. And this is one of the stories I'd like to share with you today. So, to explore uh, manipulating a brain circuit, we decided to focus on one brain region, the hippocampus, because that brain region is important for learning and memory. And we know that many red girls have difficulties with learning and memory, and we know that the red mice have difficulties with learning and memories. So how are we going to uh, activate this brain region? How are we going to manipulate the circuit? 
we're going to use a technology that has been developed in the 80s um, to, to treat Parkinson's disease. And that technology is called deep brain stimulation. And in fact, it was tested in humans. The first human treated with that was in the late 80s by uh, Professor Ben Abid, who showed that stimulating the subthalamic nucleus improves symptoms with Parkinson's disease. And today, there are over 200,000 uh, patients who've been implanted with, the, with these stimulators to help uh, with Parkinson's disease and a variety of other disorders. It's also being tested for tremors and uh, some forms of epilepsy, some forms of behavioral defects, such as obsessive-compulsive disorders. So, we decided to test whether deep brain stimulation could help restore normal learning and memory into a mouse model of Rett syndrome. And for that, we focused on the Rett mice that lack one copy of the gene in half of their cells, so they're mosaic, like the Rett females. And we waited till they were adult and implanted electrodes uh, in, in the... Uh, to stimulate the deep dentate gyrus, which I'll show you in the next picture. And after giving them deep brain stimulation for two weeks, for one hour each day, following the same protocol that typically used in humans, we waited three weeks and tested them to see if their hippocampal function improved. And to test, we looked at behavior, we looked at plasticity, how the neural circuit worked, and we looked at the birth of new neurons, because that takes place in the brain. And the area we stimulated with this deep brain stimulation, and the stimulator here is Wa well, uh, Shuang Hao and uh, Zhen Rong Tang, they stimulate the dentate gyrus, which is... Uh, they stimulate the fornix, which is a band in the brain that projects to the hippocampus, which is the site of learning and memory. The idea being, if you stimulate the fornix, you can now uh, incre increase the activity into the hippocampus, modulate the circuit, and perhaps change its plasticity. And when you stimulate the for fornix, where the deep brain stimulation red electrode is shown, and you record in the dentate gyrus, you can be sure that you're not causing harm, that you're actually stimulating the neurons, but not causing seizures. And then you ask, can the animals learn better? And this is a test we use on mice to see if they can learn. On the left, you see when the mouse is put in a milky water and there is a hidden platform, initially it's going to spend a lot of time circling the platform till it finds it and finally learn this is where it is. By the eighth trial on the right, you can see the mouse path. It will dash to the platform. And the way the mouse knows where the platform is, it, use, it uses cues on the walls in the room, and that's how it knows which quadrant the platform is in. So first, what we do is we put the mice in the milky water and see how long it takes them to get to the platform. This tells us how fast they learn where the platform is using those spatial cues. But then, if we want to see if they remember, after all this is finished, we take out the platform and we see where do they go. Do they go to the right quadrant and search it? And if you look at this graph, you'll see that the red mice in red take a lot longer to find the platform than the wild-type mice. You can see that every day it takes them longer to reach it uh, compared to wild-type mice. And more importantly, when we take the platform out and put them in the milky water, you'll notice that the wild-type mouse shown here is an open bars, hit the target, spend more time searching the target platform than they search the other areas, the, uh, the other uh, quadrants. This tells us that they remembered where it was. They searched and searched, and only when they can't find it, they go search the other areas. Whereas the red mice, you'll notice they search all quadrants the same. And on the right, you'll see that the healthy animals will cross the area of the platform far more frequently because they remembered where it was, whereas the red mice did not do that. So then we do the deep brain stimulation and ask, do we change that? On top, you'll see the healthy animals, the open circles without any stimulation, the black circles with stimulation. And you'll see this really has no effect. They continue to learn well. And they, on the right, you see they continue to cross the area of the platform just as well. Now, the red mice 
on top, you'll see the sham where they have the surgery, but there's no stimulation. But the lower curve, you'll see now after stimulation, they're learning much faster. They now are looking more similar to the wild-type animals. And if you look on the right, you'll see how while they had, on average, five or less platform crossing, after deep brain stimulation, you can see 12 and 10 platform crossings closer to the wild-type animal than they used to. So this told us their spatial learning has improved. Then we do physiology. We look at plasticity. How is the communication between the neurons? How well do these animals' uh, circuit improve? If you stimulate, uh, as shown here at time zero, give high-frequency stimulation into the hippocampus, this is just to record plasticity, and then stop the stimulation and follows the potentiation, you'll see that the red mice with the red circles over days have much lower uh, population amplitude, which tells us they have less plasticity. So you can see in every day, day zero, day one, day two, day five, they are much weaker. Their plasticity is much weaker than the healthy animals. And uh, however, after deep brain stimulation, which you see on the top graph now, the stimulated red mice, the close red circle, you'll see them much higher. And if we are to overlap them with the wild-type mice in the bottom part of the graph, you'll see now they have the same plasticity as wild-type mice. They're just on top of it. You can't actually see the wild-type animal data under that. So this was really encouraging in that it told us both the behavior and the physiology and plasticity changed. Next, we look at neurogenesis. And in this, uh, the dentate chars is this blue label structure, this label all nuclei with the cells. And then you're going to see some red and green. That's the new newborn new neurons born in that region of the brain. And in red sham animals, you barely see one. It's really rare to find newly born neurons. But after deep brain stimulation, on the right, you'll see a lot more newly born neurons in both the wild-type animals and the rat mice. So this was really excited in that every feature of the hippocampus that we could assay, we found to be improved. And uh, here is uh, the summary of the data that are presented in this paper, where we found that deep brain stimulation and the rat mice rescued the contextual fear, a form of hippocampal learning, the spatial uh, learning that I showed you in memory, as well as the in vivo physiology and the birth of new neurons or neurogenesis. Now, in part two, I mentioned to you that the RET network in females was abnormal and that there's increased synchrony. And you'll see here, this is measured in the uh, height of the bar. Wild-type animal who undergo sham surgery have low correlation of neurons firing together. When they undergo DBS, it's still relatively low. But you'll notice the red sham mice, because they have more neurons firing together, there's a higher correlation coefficient. But after deep brain stimulation, that corrected. So it's really corrected many of the features and abnormality that we see in red syndrome, which is quite uh, exciting and promising. How about the molecular changes? I mentioned to you, when we lose this protein, we got a lot of gene expression changes. So to do this, we uh, then went on to now, in both, first in male animals, do deep brain stimulation and ask, what does deep brain stimulation do to gene expression? And do that in healthy animals and in animals that totally lack the red gene. These are males. And you will see that uh, there are a lot of genes that are altered in the red animals. We've seen that in part one and in part two. Some genes are down, the shown in blue, and some genes are up. And isoforms mean the splicing variants. These are also altered. So what happens after deep brain stimulation? We found out that after deep brain stimulation, about 25% of those genes that were altered in the mice lacking MACP2 corrected back to normal. And this was quite exciting because many of these genes are critical for neuronal function, synaptic communication, as well as neurogenesis. 
The next thing we wanted to know, would this happen in females? Because the females, we did deep brain stimulation, we saw the behavioral improvement. Now, would we see correction of gene expression changes? And the answer was yes. On the left, you'll see the first uh, red column is from four different animals that are healthy, wild-type sham. After deep brain stimulation... Uh, and, and Next to it is from the heterozygous red animals. You see there are a lot of gene expression differences. So, you see blue compared to the red. These are all genes that are altered in the red female mouse. But when you uh, now do deep brain stimulation, they look very similar. For all of these genes shown here that were altered in the red mouse, it corrected back to normal level. So, this is now to summarize the studies on deep brain stimulation. We've learned that you change behavior, physiology, neurogenesis, and improve gene expression changes. So, what this told us, that in red syndrome, at least in the animal model, we learned from them that the red brain is responsive to neuromodulation. And this could be a strategy we might use. Now, the question was, to us, given the effect on gene expression, could this be applicable to other developmental disorders, autism or intellectual disability that affect the hippocampus? So, to test this idea, we looked at the data from mice that have a, a mutation in a gene that's known to cause intellectual disability. So, these are two different genes, each of which cause intellectual disability. And the mouse model has been studied, and many gene expression changes were found. And we discovered that about a quarter of the genes altered in these mice were among the genes that are corrected or, or increased upon deep brain stimulation, suggesting that perhaps deep brain stimulation could be helpful for some of these disorders. We also learned that people who died from major depression, who have had studies on their brain done, and again, a lot of gene expression changes are found, but we found about 17% of these gene expression changes could be helped or boosted by deep brain stimulation, suggesting this could be effective therapy. So, altogether, this really opens up the way for considering this modality of therapy as a potential that's irrespective, perhaps, of the gene, as long as the hippocampus is a structure that's mediating some of the symptoms, and those could be helped by stimulating the circuits. And, of course, we are uh, doing these studies to explore that, particularly the lab of Jean Rong Tang. Now, this was for RET, where you lose the protein. How about when you have an extra copy of the protein? Uh, first of all, can you reverse the symptoms? And second, can we do something for a treatment? So, here, recall that uh, mice with the duplication had all the features of the human disease. These mice had one mouse gene and one extra copy that we genetically added that was the human gene. And we quickly learned from this mouse that doubling the dosage of this protein can cause all the features shown on this slide, intellectual learning and memory issues, autism, motor problems, seizures, and so on. And we learned that the patients have all of the same features, and in both mice and humans, there's epilepsy and early death. So, the first question we wanted to ask is, if we genetically remove one of these extra copies in adult animals that have been symptomatic, can we help the mice? That was the first question. And second, if that's the case, can we use a therapy that we could use in the clinic? So, today I'm going to tell you about... summarize both of these stories. The first one, using a mouse that has an extra copy of the gene, but that extra copy is engineered where it can be deleted in an adult. And the second study is where we use a small piece of DNA called an antisense oligonucleotide that we did in collaboration with Ionis Pharmaceuticals. For first, let me tell you about the genetic studies. This is measuring activity uh, in an open field. And you see that in black are the wild-type animals, um, and they move quite well. And then you see in the middle, the green and the gray are the duplication animals either carrying just the drug, but without the enzyme to allow removal of the extra gene, or just the enzyme that allows removal of the gene, but without the drug that activates the enzyme. So, these are two 
both of them, if you will, have an extra copy and you haven't removed it. But in pink is when we add the enzyme that can remove the extra gene and give the drug that activates the enzyme, tamoxifen. And now you'll see the animals are moving quite normally. And on the right, you'll see the traces from all the different groups. So that's one example that showed us genetically removing the extra copy in an adult symptomatic mouse can actually help. And then we did the same for anxiety. Mice don't like to be in an open arm, and you'll see the wild-type animals spend more time in the open arm, but the duplication mice, uh, the green and the gray, they don't. However, when we now remove the extra copy, they do better. And last, we look at gene expression. You'll see on the left, uh, again, the, uh, the two duplication mice, green and gray, You'll see them segregated separately, but once we remove the extra copy of the gene, now they're intermingled with the black. The pink and the black are all intermingled because their gene expressions are the same. They cluster together. So this told us that in an adult, if you remove the extra copy of the gene, you can rescue many of the symptoms. You can rescue the molecular changes. So can we now do this with a molecule or a drug, if you will, that you can use, eventually translate for the clinic. And for that, we collaborate with IONIS to use something called antisense oligonucleotides. These are small pieces of DNA that are chemically modified, and they can bind RNA in the nucleus. And when they do, the heteroduplex between a DNA and RNA will be recognized by an enzyme called RNAs H, and that will degrade the RNA, freeing the oligonucleotide to go bind and more RNA, and eventually it'll allow you to decrease the protein. So we turned to our duplication mice, and we gave them the antisense treatment in the, in the ventricle in the brain. And you'll see here on the left are the white bars, the healthy animals. Um, in the gray are the duplication mice, the transgenic duplication. You see they move less. And when we give them the antisense oligo, now they can move much faster and they look more similar to normal. And the same is true about their ability to stand on their hind legs and rear or their ability to enter to the center of the field. All their activities are corrected. And you can easily see from the traces below a healthy mouse on the left, the duplication on the right doesn't move as much, a duplication on the uh, extreme, in the middle, sorry, that's the duplication in the middle. And on the extreme right, you'll see now the duplication after eliminating the extra human copy using the ASO, that they do much better in their movement. Then we wanted to see, how about if we wait till the animals are very sick? They're very symptomatic with seizures, and they're having seizures every day. That's about the age of seven to eight months or more. And at that time, they have seizures all the time, and their EEG is very abnormal. How about if we treat them then and see if we can normalize the EEG and stop the seizure? And the answer was yes. So on the left, you see tracing from a healthy animal, normal EEG. In the middle, you see an animal that has an extra copy. You see their EEG is very abnormal because they were having a seizure at that time. But after four weeks of treatment where we normalize the level of MACP2, the seizure stopped and the EEG normalized. So this was really exciting because it told us that this disease is reversible, at least in mice and that we have a strategy that's clinically translatable using this antisense oligonucleotide to treat. But there's one little challenge in that in the original mice we used, there was one human copy and one mouse copy, and we eliminated the one human copy so the mouse was safe with its one extra mouse copy. However, humans have two identical copies, and you have to be sure you don't go too low, because if you go too low, you're going to give them Rett syndrome. So for that, what we did, we created new mice that had two different copies of the human gene. And you see on the right that they have twice the level of the protein, as shown in the pink bar. And then we asked, can you titrate the dose of the drug now? Because you don't want to go too low. And you'll see in this one, on the left is a controlled animal that have normal MACP2. Then the duplication animals that have high levels of MACP2, but we gave them the control ASO, so it doesn't do anything. This is a random ASO. 
Then you give the MACP2 ASO and you see in a dose-dependent matter manner, as you increase the dose, you lower the protein. And basically, the animals with 500 microgram have the reach a level that's very similar to wild type, whereas those with 250 micrograms, it's not quite as uh, low, but it's significantly decreased. So then we ask, what happens if we treat with those two dosages that are safe? And for this test I'm showing you, we're studying motor coordination. We put the animals on this rotating rod, and the longer they stay on the rod, the more coordinated and or they have persevering activity. And this is what happened to the duplication mice in red. You'll see they stay on the rod, they just don't fall because they just constantly want to stay on it. It's almost stereotype repetitive behavior. However, after treating them with the ASOs and normalizing the level of the protein, they're now running with the wild type, very similar to the wild type. So, in summary then, what we learned from these two studies is that if you stimulate the fornix with deep brain stimulation, there is a promise that this could help uh, Rett syndrome, given the effect we've seen on all the functions of the hippocampus that we could assay in the model. And we think this actually may be helpful to other neuropsychiatric disorders where hippocampal dysfunction may be a problem. We also learned that antisense oligonucleotide uh, can be potentially helpful uh, for the MACP2 duplication mice. We saw them reverse the symptoms and rescue many phenotypes. And, of course, what we need to do now before translating this therapy into the clinic is make sure we can titrate the dose. And when we uh, be able to monitor that we're bringing MACP2 levels just to the right amount, not too low, so as not to incur any other complications from red like features. And with that, I'd like to thank all the contributors to this work, both past members and current members, as well as uh, all of our co collaborators on the DBS and computational studies, and of course, Ionis Pharmaceuticals. And special thanks to the Red Syndrome families and MACP2 disorders families. Thank you.